we started uh, our career uh, now uh, 12 years ago that we want to study uh, the biochemistry of, ap of apoptosis and in particularly how the caspase 3 as an example is become activated during apoptosis. And we actually took a, 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 a relative uh, a new approach at that time that is trying to uh, set up uh, the biochemical reaction and study the biochemical reactions that will uh, activate caspase 3. And in this case, and we make uh, cell extracts, um, so-called S100 extracts. Basically, you break the cell in hypotonic buffer, and then you pellet all the organelles and the membranes uh, with the 100,000 uh, G4 spin. And you take the supernatant, which is called S100, that usually are, uh, uh, people use that as, as a cytosolic fraction. And we take this cytosolic fraction, and and at that time we make this S100 from large cultured HeLa cells. And one interesting uh, part in here is we take we made this S100 from the living cells. The cell is not act uh, apoptosis is not activated. So if we incubate uh, in this case uh, a in vitro translated uh, S35 labeled Procaspase 3 with the S100 from HeLa cells. And you see that it will, uh, the Procaspase 3 is not going to be cleaved and activated. But in one of these experiments, and we add small uh, nucleotides into the uh, S100 fraction. And we found, uh, actually quite surprisingly, that either ATP or even better, deoxy ATP is able to accelerate this caspase 3 activation. And in the cell extract that's made from the living cells, meaning that with addition of DATP, we can trigger apoptosis basically in vitro in a test tube. And this gives us an assay, so allow us to uh, fractionate the cell extracts and reconstitute this Procaspase 3 activation reaction. So in this way, we are able to identify the components as well as the reaction that give the Caspase 3 activation. So here is a, a, a general scheme that how we perform that experiment. So we take uh, S100 from HeLa cells, and we separate these uh, S100 uh, by a different uh, chromatography steps. And in this case, we separate it into, we can separate S100 into three different fractions, and we call it uh, apoptotic uh, protease activating factors, APAFs. And we know that in S100, before we fractionate, uh, we can add DATP to uh, activate caspase 3. And after we separate into these different fractions, and we show in here that we can put all three fractions together, we can reconstitute the, this particular DATP dependent caspase 3 activation. That meaning that within S100, there are three protein factors that is necessary and sufficient to activate the caspase 3. So, uh, we use a strategy that we can fix two of the factors as constant and further fractionate the third factor until we get that factor purified and identified uh, as what it is. And using this strategy, we are able to uh, identify that all these three uh, factors are required for the caspase reactivation. And here is the first factor we purified, and this is the last column step we use. And here is just basic demonstration of what we, uh, we saw. That these numbers are the fractions that collected from this particular column and eluded with a linear uh, assault gradient. And we measure the activity of this factor in these fractions by adding radio-labeled uh, pro-caspase 3 
as well as the two other uh, the fractions that are containing the two other factor together with DATP and we saw a nice activity peak around fraction two to four and then we run these protein uh, these fractions on the SDS page and the stain with silver and we saw this small protein down there uh, that appear to appear to be purified homogeneity and also that correlate perfectly with this uh, functional uh, activity. So this is the first protein that we purified. And at that time, we also noticed after we purified this protein, the, fra the fractions containing this protein also looks pink, and which was quite surprising to us because at that, at that time, none of the proteins known involving apoptosis uh, are known to have a pigment. And but with, with the color, and we can uh, put in a, a spectra, uh, uh, putting a, a, a spectrometer, and read its absorbance profile. And this is exactly what we did. And here is the uh, absorbance profile. And you can see they have this uh, three uh, peaks of absorption. And after, take, after get this absorption profile, and compare to the uh, textbook, and we realized very quickly that the protein we purified is actually cytochrome C, and which was a, a, a very big surprise at that time. Um, it took us a long time to even convince ourselves that cytochrome C is indeed something we are after as a, as a caspase activating factor, because a cytochrome C is such a well-studied protein. And even in our uh, 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 introductory biochemical uh, textbook that we know cytochrome C, which is this little pink guy, uh, is a part of an electron transfer chain in the mitochondria. In the living cells, the cytochrome C is exclusively localized in the mitochondria. It has a heme uh, uh, cofactor in it, and it's part of an electron transfer chain. And what is interesting is uh, they take electrons from uh, cytochrome C reductase, and they donate electrons uh, for cytochrome C oxidase. And we all know this electron transfer chain, which is at, happening at the inner membrane of mitochondria, uh, is the major energy source that provide uh, by uh, oxidative phosphorylation ATP uh, to, our, uh, to our cells. The interesting part is the cytochrome C is the only water-soluble electron the component of the electron transfer chain, and they are trapped uh, inside the mitochondria by the outer membrane of the mitochondria. Although the cytochrome C is encoded by the nuclear gene, they are made, they are made the, the proprotein is made in the cytosol, but they can, the, the heme, -like, heme can, uh, ligand is only added inside the mitochondria because the heme lies is, in, is inside the mitochondria. And only when the heme is added, the protein is folded properly, uh, but they are trapped in the mitochondria. And we later on realized that the reason that we are able to get cytochrome C from in our S100 fraction, which presumably is a cytosolic fraction, is when we're making the cell extracts in a hypotonic buffer we not only break out membrane of, of cells, we also broke the outer membrane of mitochondria. So in this way, the cytochrome C actually leaked out to the, uh, to the cytosolic fraction. And we are actually, uh, uh, in this case, uh, uh, extremely lucky because the cytochrome C release from the mitochondria out of, uh, from the mitochondria is actually one of the key uh, uh, initiating events for apoptosis. So we basically, by breaking this, in the process of making uh, cell extracts, we initiated the uh, unknowingly uh, uh, mimicked the, the apoptotic initiation process. So uh, here, just to give you a, a visual demonstration that the protein like cytochrome C, which normally localized in the uh, mitochondria, uh, if you stain these proteins in living cell, you see they have, you see show this punctated stain and indicate the mitochondrial localization. 
if you give them uh, apoptotic st stimulus such as UV radiation and you wait for a few hours for the apoptosis uh, to happen and you can see the, the protein, the, the mitochondrial protein like cytochrome C start to come out of the mitochondria and in the late stage of apoptosis they are diffused staining, they are everywhere. So release from the mitochondria to the cytosolic compartment is a critical uh, step for apoptosis to happen. But the one reason that we are so uh, surprised about uh, the cytochrome C is the previous uh, uh, electron transfer activity has nothing to do with this ability to activate the caspase. And we don't know at that time how the cytochrome C will be able to activate the caspase. So uh, to understand that process required the purification and identification of the other two proteins. And one of them is APAF1. Again, we use the same strategy and by fixing the two other factors and purify the third factor homogeneity and in this case APAF1 which run about 140 kilodaltons. Um, and when we get a protein sequence from APAF1, and we realize that we are dealing at that time a novel protein, that protein never been uh, characterized before. And use the protein sequence, we eventually able to clone the, the full length protein, and which is <coughs> the uh, a diagram here. And this protein is a, uh, is a big protein, it's about uh, 140 kilodaltons uh, long. But once we get the protein sequence, and we quickly recognize that this protein has three distinct domains. At the N-terminal part, it has a domain called CAR domain, and I will talk a uh, little more about this domain in the next few slides. The CAR stands for caspase recruitment domain. So its, it's function is recruit caspase. And in the middle part of this protein um, has homology with the CID4 protein of C. elegant. And if you still remember, CID4 is an integral part of the uh, apoptotic pathway in C. elegant. And CID4 is functioning upstream of CID3, which is C. elegant caspase. And its function is critical for the uh, apoptosis in that organism. Uh, so this region is homologous to CID4, and it has two uh, unique features about this domain. It's called Walker's A and B box. And this Walker's A and B box are known nucleotide bounding uh, sequences, which again, uh, not very surprising, uh, because the, the initial observation about this, uh, the function of the system is we need to add nucleotide and particularly uh, deoxyATP to the S100 in order to trigger this uh, caspase activation. And with APAF1 has a uh, nucleotide bounding region is, is truly not surprising. What was a little bit surprising was this C terminus uh, has 13 WD40 repeats. These WD40 repeats are these uh, protein motifs that usually have 40 amino acids long and they often uh, end it with a tryptophan or aspartic acid. That's how they, we call them WD40 repeats. And these are the protein motifs often mediated protein-protein interaction and APOP1 has 13 of them. What was a little bit surprising was uh, the, the warm C. elegant does not have this uh, WD40 repeats. The CID4 protein uh, literally ended uh, right before that. So which telling us that the apoptotic program of human and C. elegant, uh, although share the, the homologous protein, that their mode of action is quite different. <coughs> <coughs> For example, now we know um, the function of cytochrome C is, uh, is probably not conserved in C. elegant in uh, activation caspase. So this APAF1, uh, uh, when, uh, when, when you do immunostaining, and this uh, 
and it's all cytosolic lo uh, location in the living cells. Again, which tell you that in the living cells, uh, the APAF1 and the cytochrome C are separated, separated by the outer membrane of mitochondria. And only during apoptosis, cytochrome C come out of the mitochondria, they are able to uh, trigger apoptosis. And the third uh, factor, uh, which we initially called uh, APAF3, here is again we purified this protein and uh, identified this APAF3 protein as another caspase, which is caspase 9. So this told us that the caspase 3 activation is actually through a cascade of caspase, with caspase 9 as the upstream caspase, which are required for the activation of caspase 3, which is a downstream caspase. So what the difference between caspase 9 and caspase 3 is that make uh, caspase 9 a, a initiator caspase and caspase 3 a, a downstream caspase. Here uh, I lined these uh, caspases uh, together and you see all these numbers, these are the uh, caspases uh, encoded in human genome. Now uh, we know there are at least 12 of them. But the function, the, the, that the caspase function in apoptosis, uh, the, 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 the well characterized ones are all listed here. And the reason that we recognize they are caspase is they are, their active side, the sequence around their active side, uh, this uh, cysteine, uh, QAC uh, GG, is conserved between all caspases. Um, the difference between caspase 9 and caspase 3 and 7 is the caspase 3 and 7 uh, are smaller and they homologous to caspase 9 uh, at the C terminus. But caspase 9 has additional domains at N terminus. And this domain is also uh, homologous to CARD, caspase recruitment domain. So remember, APAF1 protein also have a card at their end terminus. And these cards are actually the protein-protein interactions uh, domains that um, basically like secret handshake that, uh, that how they found their partner. Another uh, uh, pair of caspases are caspase A and, A and 10. And also, uh, unlike caspase 3 and 7, caspase A and 10, also has additional uh, domains at its end terminus. But instead of cards, they are called DED domains for death effector domains. Their function, where I'm also going to discuss in the next few slides. So uh, after we identified the, these three factors required for apoptotic uh, ca activation of caspp 3 um, so uh, after again, uh, many years of work, now we can summarize these uh, reactions into this particular pathway. We call it uh, apoptotic, uh, ap uh, mitochondrial apoptotic pathway, or also called uh, intrinsic um, apoptotic pathway. And the reason why we call them intrinsic uh, versus extrinsic will become clear in the, next, uh, in, the, in the later part of my talk. So, we know that apoptotic stimuli now, uh, such as uh, radiation by UV light, um, will exert the, this, their effects on mitochondria. And the signal is uh, interpreted by the BCL2 uh, family of proteins. The BCL2 family of protein regulate uh, apoptotic response uh, by mitochondria. As a result, the proteins such as cytochrome C that normally localize in the inter intermembrane space of mitochondria will come out of the mitochondria and find this bonding partner APAF1. And APAF1 has a, 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 a good affinity for cytochrome C. So when the cytochrome C come out of the, uh, to the cytosol, they will meet APAF1. They will specifically bound APAF1 at the, the WD40 repeat region. And in the presence of a nucleotide, um, uh, preferably 
deoxynucleotide, DATP, and this cytochrome C and APAF1 will form this large heptamer protein complex. Now we call it apoptosome. The car domain of APAF1, before it meets cytochrome C, before it's formed this apoptosome, is folded in and not accessible. So after the formation of apoptosome, um, which is like this uh, wind wheel-like structure, um, the, the car domains form the central ring of this wheel-like structure. And the car domain now become exposed, and they are able to recruit the, through the car to car interaction of Procaspase 9. And once Procaspase 9 get recruited to apoptosome, they undergo this auto-activation process, the, the molecular detail we still do not understand. And, but as a result, the Caspase 9 APOF1 cytochrome C complex now have this enzymatic activity that able to cleave the Caspase 3 and 7 precursor and results in its activation, which subsequently cleave many important substrates such as DFF45 or ACAT, leading to the characteristic changes associated with apoptosis. I also want to point out uh, that some of the deoxynucleotide analogs, such as 2CDA, uh, also called clodrobine, uh, another one called uh, flodrobine, these nucleotide analogs are actually uh, uh, a clinically used uh, drugs that uh, uh, for treat uh, leukemia. Um, and these nucleotides uh, can substitute uh, DATP to drive the formation of apoptosome. And in certain cases, for example, flodropine is even better than deoxyATP to cause apoptosome. So uh, here is uh, uh, just give you a brief uh, uh, a visual demonstration what is apoptosome looks like. And here is, is the early uh, cryo EM structure of apoptosome uh, generated in, at Chris Aikis group in Boston University. Uh, as you see here, it's a beautiful structure. It's just like wind wheel with a central ring. And also the spikes come out of the central ring. Uh, the cytochrome C is somewhere here, uh, this, this hump. Uh, although we couldn't actually see it with 27 angstrom resolution, but recently a higher resolution structure uh, unequivocally demonstrated the cytochrome C is in here. It's bound at a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, it's a flat structure, just like a flying saucer, um, and with this uh, central ring and, 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 the, and the hole. Um, when the cytochrome C, cast, when the caspase 9 bound to the apoptosome, and the, the, the hole in the central ring was covered, it's like a, uh, covered with a dome, and this dome is formed uh, by the caspase 9. And here it's demonstrated that um, this large protein complex, uh, cytochrome C, APOF1, and the caspase 9, uh, are able to cleave uh, pro caspase 3, and this is the, the active form of the enzyme caspase 9. So uh, upstream mitochondria, and I introduce you uh, to you the, the BCL2 family of proteins. And these BCL2 family of proteins have three categories: the, the anti-apoptotic proteins such as BCL2, and the back-back uh, pro-apoptotic protein, as well as B3 only pro-apoptotic protein. So here, I'm just going to summarize with you and what we have known now, uh, how these proteins interact with each other and to control the permeability of mitochondria out membrane. So uh, apoptotic stimuli, uh, again, such as UV, and will uh, activate uh, through the BH3 only protein first. And these proteins are uh, normally uh, not associated with mitochondria, it's called in other cellular compartment, or it may be transcription targets for uh, 
P53, for example, a puma and an oxa, our transcription target for P53, as you, you know, the P53 level will increase in response to radiation. And these speech 3 only proteins will, will uh, transduce their signals uh, to a uh, back and back. And the anti-apoptotic proteins, such as BCL2, BCLXL, or MCL1, will able to bound to the BH3 only protein and neutralize this activity. Um, the activation of Bax and Back by the BH3 only protein um, can cause Bax and Back to oligomerize on the outer membrane mitochondria. And in, in case of Bax, uh, it also uh, translocates from the cytosol to mitochondria as well. And the exact molecular mechanism of this activation of Bax-Bax -back and its oligomerization is still not very well understood. The anti-apoptotic uh, BCL2 or BCLXL will also able to directly bound Bax or Bax and inhibit its uh, uh, oligomerization. So as you can see, uh, the, the anti as well as pro uh, death member of this family uh, interact with each other and to uh, form this complex signaling complex to finally leading to the oligomerization of backs and back. And these oligomerized backs and back are believed uh, to be protein channels that allow the proteins such as cytochrome C uh, to come out of mitochondria to the cytosol and, and cause apoptosis. And in addition to cytochrome C, there are now quite a few other proteins uh, also come out of mitochondrial intermembrane space, such as Indo-G, Indonucleus G, AF for apoptose-inducing uh, uh, factor, as well as SMAC, Diablo, or HTRA2, or OMI, uh, also come out of mitochondria and play a, a, a role in apoptosis. And I'm also I'm going to uh, discuss uh, a uh, little more about SMAC Diablo uh, in a later part of my talk because we understand how it's function quite well.